Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here today. One of the things that was brought to my mind was the truth of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where God lets us know that it's not personalities, but it's God's faithfulness that brings us His Word. So that whether a brother that we're used to is here or not, the Word goes forth. So we should not uh, give praise to man, but give praise to God for men and, and the ladies who pray as well for the word being faithful to our hearts, whatever uh, the container that God uses to pour out a drink of water, I want that water, don't you? The book of the Revelation, chapter number 2. Did any of you gentlemen find that passage or that phrase that I asked you about? Okay. All right then. Second chapter of the book of the Revelation, beginning with verse number 26. He is speaking to the messenger in verse 18 of the church in Thyatira. These are seven churches in Asia. And he's speaking to them, and he begins to wind up his message to them with the same word that he gives in all the churches, he that overcometh. In verse 26, we read, and he that overcometh and keepeth my, be careful, what's the next word? word. It's not word, is it? He that keepeth my works. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. He that keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. That's our subject title today, power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Even as I received of my father. Wow. I will give you the power that my father has given me. Brother Bob Well did bring that out this morning. All authority is given me in heaven and in earth. That's the only two places I know about. I'm on earth. I'm born on earth, but I sit in heavenly places with Christ. But that next word, that, that next verse says, Go ye therefore. Now why? Is that word, therefore, therefore? It's there to say what Brother Al brought forth. You don't have to go and preach to all nations without me being in and with you. Go ye Therefore, because I have received all power in heaven and in earth, you can go in that power and nobody will be able to stand against you as you go in the spirit of the Lord. That's an amazing thing. He shall rule with a rod of iron, even as I received of my father. This thing is being handed down from God the Father to God the Son, and then by God the Holy Ghost to the church. But how in the world do we understand this thing about having power over the nations? I hope that we will have some light on that before we leave here today. And he shall rule and I will give him the morning star. Now he's already given you the same ability that he had from his father to rule over the nations. 
but it's going to give you something else. I will give you the morning star. Can you hold your place and go to Revelation twenty two sixteen and tell me who is the morning star? What does he mean by the morning star? Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the church. Church says, I am the root and offspring of David. You finish it. So who is the bright and morning star? The Lord Jesus Christ. And we know scientifically that the morning star appears brightly in the sky before the sun rises. I think it's Venus. Young people, am I right? Oh, no. Okay. It's a big old star that appears in the sky before the sun rises. So there's something in the darkness of the night that gives you hope that the sun S-U-N of righteousness shall arise with healing in his, not its, his wings. The bright and morning star is Jesus Christ who is the light of the world and he shines in your heart in the world of darkness. So this is an amazing promise of God. He shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. How? Even as, in the same way that I received of my Father, I'm going to give it unto you. And I will give him the morning star. Have you ever had a long night of sickness and pain? Have you ever had a long night of dread because you had a dental appointment the next morning and they were going to do a root canal? You just thought that night would never end. And then finally there's a little bit of dawn, not dishwashing detergent, but the, the arising of the sun begins to peek through your window and the long night of dread is over with. But there's something before that. There is the bright star. There is the morning star star and we have the authority of Christ's word himself written down by the apostle John given the numbers 2216 of the book of revelation for us to have and it's right there in your lap i am the bright and morning star in your darkest hour in your greatest dread in your time of greatest fear I will be with you all the way, even to the end of the world, for you can do nothing without me. Isn't that good? I am the light of the world. All intelligence are all, of all creatures, of every degree of in intellect, is from Christ. I am the light of the world. But there's a different category in the rest of that verse, this is John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. You don't know two and two is four, except Jesus gave us that ability to know that. But the last part of that verse says, He that followeth after me shall have not just the light of the world, which he won't lose, he'll still have that, but he shall have the light of life. Isn't that good? We beheld his glory, and in his life did we have light. Somebody sang an old song, said, you light up my life. Well, that probably didn't last long. Probably about a year and a half later, they got a divorce. But it just shows you that there is that persona of glory that comes from Christ, that no matter how dark the night is, and maybe you didn't have that night of dread. But somewhere in the world, maybe somewhere on your street, on your road, somewhere maybe even in your family, 
especially in the human family, somebody somewhere was having a night of dread, but you slept soundly because the day star preceding the sun to bring the day was warming your heart. And as we say, we slept like a baby. Ain't God good? So we understand that the Lord is telling us that the church shall be the ones that rules the nations. It's the church that alone has the morning star. So if I have the morning star in verse 28, then I'm part of the church. And it is through his church that he shall rule the nations even as my Father hath given to me. So, Brother Al, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. But the vine, the true vine, because there's a false vine over there in the latter part of the book of the Revelation. Therefore, it says the true vine. He is the one that brings forth the branches and those who do not bear fruit, they are purged, cut off, and it brings more growth to those who do bear fruit and the fruit is sweeter and more abundant. So we bear the fruit of Christ in the world and it comes from originally the Father to the Son by the Holy Ghost to us. I'm going to send you another comforter. And when he comes, he shall take of mine. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. So he says, this is so good. I want to share it with you. And I am going to take not only my Father's goodness in sharing it, but I'm going to take also my Father's way of sharing it, and I'm going to pass it on to you like the Father passed it on to me. How did the Father pass it on to him? He said, everything that I hear of my Father, I will tell you. Hmm. How did he hear of the Father? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's just as much God as God the Father. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as God the Son. These three are not three gods. They are one. So there's an awareness into the humanity of God so that they may be a humanity into the peoples of God. How did the Spirit of the Son come into the world by natural birth? How did you get here by natural birth? How did you come to know the passage of God's grace and glory from the Father to the Son by the Holy Ghost to you by birth? You're born again. So, as the Father hath sent me, I like these next two words, even so, just like that, send I you. The Father was not mad and angry with us, and Jesus had to say, Now, Daddy, you've got to calm down a little bit, because I'm going to die for these. God loved us from the foundation of the world. And when we sing that song that we just sang, it said her soul was bound for hell. And I always say as far as she knew. But her soul wasn't bound for hell because Jesus gave her the water. But as far as she knew, her soul was bound for hell. As far as we knew, we were in outer darkness. We were cast out. But Jesus came out to where we were. As lepers, we covered our mouth and said, unclean, unclean, don't come up 
Don't come out here. Don't come out of the city gates. Don't approach me. You'll get defiled. Jesus said, you can't defile glory. And he came to where we were. Isn't that good? That, that, that's glorious. It's amazing that God came to where we were. It's, it's amazing how the Lord does that. It doesn't matter if you're at 547 Covington Street and you're trying to hide from your wife and the preacher. Jesus can get in and get you ready for them before they even get there. Amen, Brother Kenny. Amen. You got it right. <laughs> I love to tell his story <laughs> of unseen things above. So we see that Jesus is telling the church, I am going to cause you to rule over the nations. If you keep my works unto the end, if you abide unto the end, the same shall be saved. If you're doing his works, you're only doing it by the Holy Spirit. The reason that the grapevine produces grapes is because the root produces the sap that is the, is the identity and has the nature of and the character of a grapevine. So it don't produce watermelons or cantaloupe or uh, any other fruit. It produces grapes because it comes from the root, which is Christ. And so we, in doing his works, doing his work, we can't be doing it except by him. For without me, you can do nothing. So it's not I that live but Christ that liveth in me. The life that I now live, I live by the, the person of the Son of God who lives within me. My responsibility is to stay dead and to stay out of the way and to seek for God and learn that every time that I need Christ to manifest himself through me, it requires a resurrection. Colossians 3 said, if you be raised with Christ. It ain't talking about the physical resurrection from the grave. It's talking about being born again. It's talking about sanctification. Every time that I'm required to do anything, I have to have Christ doing it because without him, I can do nothing. So the Lord is going to make himself one with the church, even as Adam was made one with Eve. And these two shall be one flesh. But in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So there is no hiccup. There is no uh-oh. There, there's nothing to hinder. There's nothing to stop the flow. There, there won't be any stopped up veins or arteries to prevent the healthy flow of blood and life. It will come from the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit, through the church. That which I do, you do. Your identity is me. You say, I can't do it. Exactly. Even as hmm, I received of the Father. So the Son on earth couldn't do anything except the Father did it through Him. I do always those things that please my Father. The words that I speak unto you, they're not mine. They're the words that the Father gave me. I thank thee, Father, that thou hast heard me. But for these people standing here, I'm praying out loud here at Lazarus' tomb in John chapter 11. 
so that they can hear what you and I have already talked about. There's no other prayer listed in John chapter 11. How in the world did he pray to the Father? With groanings which cannot be uttered. There were prayers like lightning shooting between the throne of God and the Son of God standing out there. And the reason that he wept was not because Lazarus was dead. It was because that he was life. It wasn't because everybody understood that Lazarus was dead. It was because that nobody understood that he was the resurrection and the life. The resurrection is not a scheduled event. The resurrection is the person of Christ. I prayed for these brothers. I prayed for our, I prayed for our music people. And I know that the Lord alone, alone, the Lord alone, and the Lord only, put alone and only together, you get a lonely. I make up words every once in a while. Just stick with me. I'll straighten it out. The Lord only can provide us with the contents and the setting for our worship. And therefore, everybody involved, even those that sit on the benches and never come down to the front where they can be seen, they are involved because they come into the house of the Lord seeking the Lord's face so that every joint supplies. The Spirit of God finds no uh, restraint or, or no deterrent for the flow of the revelation of the glory of God. I don't want to be the virus that comes into the church, the spiritual virus, and hinders the flow of the Spirit. I don't want to be here looking around in curiosity. I want to be here as the brother prayed in his prayer, hearing from the Lord. I want to hear from God. All of us wanting to hear from God removes any stopped up veins or arteries that our worldly cholesterol might have caused. And there is a flowing of the Holy Spirit, and we become as one. And therefore, the Father is pleased because he gave to the Son, and the Son by the Holy Spirit who takes of his and shows it unto us. All things are mine because I received them of my Father. The Father is pleased because the Holy Spirit then appropriates his Son in the same manner that the Father was appropriated to the Son, so the Father is appropriated to us by the Son. So this verse cannot mean that some well-meaning religionist, whether it be Mr. Cromwell or whoever it is, can say, I'm here to be conqueror of the world and I'm going to rule over everybody. That's not what he's talking about. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't have a sword. Peter had one and it got him in trouble. He showed how clumsy he was as a fisherman trying to do some sword fighting. Instead of lobbing off the guy's head, all he got was his ear. And then Jesus turned around, knocked the dirt off of it, and stuck it back on and reversed everything he did. So it's not talking about the church militant, conquering the world, putting everybody under our blue laws, and rule over everybody through morality. That's awful. What is it we can't do without him? Stay out of the way. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. All authority is given me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, next word. Therefore. You don't go because you've got a commission. You go because you've got a commissioner. Commissioner. 
He's going to do it in you. He's going to do it through you. He won't do it without you. There will not be any fruit unless the branch bears fruit, but it must abide in the vine. Isn't God good? So he says, you shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. Even as I received of my Father. Have you ever thought of yourself as an extension of God the Father? You say that can be dangerous. Yeah, but it can be good. You shouldn't miss this blessing just because some other people take advantage of it and act like God told them to do this, you know, and rule over everybody and bring, be a tyrant and, and, and rule over everybody. Uh, he said, we're not lords over God's heritage. We're servants of God's heritage. He said, I know what the Gentiles do. They want to put everybody in suppression. But that ain't the way we are. That's the four kingdoms of the world. But the fifth kingdom that shall last forever is not going to be like that. But the greatest in the kingdom of Christ shall be servant to all. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Isn't that amazing? That's how we've got to retrain our brain. We've got to understand. You get on God's elevator and mash up, you're going down. Knowledge puffeth up. I don't care if it is Calvinism. I don't care if it is religious knowledge. It don't matter what kind of knowledge it is. It puffs up. And God hates a proud look. So yes, we need knowledge, but we need wisdom in order to know how to apply and when to apply that knowledge. So the Lord is going to, can I say, mitigate. He is going to govern, control. He, he is going to mete out that which God has given him in fullness. Colossians, what is it, 2.9? He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus got the full load. But I told the Lord this morning on the way to church, Lord, I appreciate you being patient with me. It took you seven or eight years to be able to get me to the place where I am right now. And I know that now, just like I've seen people do, hold a little old baby sparrow in their hand, hardly even got any feathers. And they take an eyedropper, and they can't squirt the full eyedropper into that little sparrow's mouth, just one little drop at a time. I said, Lord, I'm a naked little sparrow. I ain't got sense enough to get in out of the rain. And I was out in the rain. It was you? Yeah. I did bring my umbrella, but I reached up and grabbed the one, the first one I could get, and it's got pink all over it. Mike, man, the Lord sure can humiliate you. So I go in the store with my pink umbrella, and I'm talking to the Lord. Lord, I ain't got sense enough to get in out of the rain, and even if I do, I get the wrong umbrella. But here I am with you just with your little eyedropper, even so, even so, Send I you. But that's being very gracious and very kind. You know, mamas sometimes get up to here with kids and they'll say, Do you know how long I was in labor for you? <laughs> and we want to tell them, Do you understand what all I've had to go through for you? But Jesus don't ever do that. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, he's been patient with me. One little eyedropper at a time. And he's got an ocean of glory that he wants to reveal. He said, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So I got to go back to heaven and send the Holy Spirit and he'll teach you. 
Even as. That's very gracious. It's the same content in the little drop I get as it is in the vast ocean of God's glory. It ain't no different. Take a sample of the ocean of God's glory. Compare it with a drop in the little bird's mouth. It's exactly the same thing. As the Father, even so. Isn't that good? He is appropriating God to you according to not our need, but according to our hunger. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. Saturday morning, it was raining. The mate didn't get up till around noon. Couldn't hardly walk. And I thought, I'm going to do something for us. No, you know, cold Saturday morning, and nothing really going on. And I happened to see on YouTube this big old guy. He said, I'm going to make a mountain man's breakfast. So I said, I'm going to try that. So I made a mountain man's breakfast in one skillet. Chopped up potato, diced little squares of potatoes. Chopped up onion. A bunch of garlic. And then I cracked six eggs in it after the potatoes and the onions were done. And brushed it all Okay, broke all those yolks, and they oozed down between those potatoes, and the eggs begin to cook. And then I put about a half a pound of cheese on top of it. I wish you'd have been there. <laughs> you do too, don't you? Yeah. And the man said, now don't cover this, because if you cover it, it'll make the moisture stay in it. So I didn't cover it. And while the potatoes and onions are cooking, I'm just a turning. And the eggs, I'm just a turning. But then I put all that cheese on top, and I thought, that cheese ain't going to melt. So I said, he can't see me. He don't know that I'm going to break his rule. So I got me a piece of Reynolds wrap, aluminum foil. And I, made, I tore off the size of the skillet and put it on top of it and turned it way down low, and that cheese melted and went down in it. Now, what in the world has this got to do with the message? You don't care. You're just enjoying the story. What it's got to do with the message is she sits back, mashes her button in her chair, leans back, and I bring her her plate on her tray and her little fork that she likes, and the salt and pepper, because there ain't no sense bringing it to if you don't bring us salt and pepper. And and I go back in there, and, and man, I'm loading up my plate. Brother Kenny, you'd be proud of it. I mean, I was loading up my plate. By the time I got in there, she said, I'm full. What? We ain't even sat down to eat together yet. I'm full. I'm full, Lord. That's what it's got to do with the message. The size of the drop I get as a naked little, no account little sparrow bird has to do with the ability of mine to be able to consume it. Not if, but since spiritual hunger is blessed, what should I do? Make sure that I don't fill myself up and wear my brain out with junk. You ain't supposed to stop by McDonald's on the way to Grandmama's house on Thanksgiving and fill up on hamburgers. She's got a big old meal waiting on you. And dear soul, 
I realize my responsibility in that bird, that I need to grow some feathers and spread my wings, and I need to exercise so that my hunger will elevate, so that the great giver of life and light, even as he received of the Father, is more satisfied with being able to eat with me and taste and see that the Lord is good. She couldn't help it. Every time she takes a bite, she gets cramps in her abdomen. I don't know that she took more than one bite. I didn't tell the mountain man that the city woman couldn't eat, but just one little bite. But guess what? She was just as full with one bite before I could sit down as I was. And I hate to tell you, (laughs) I cleaned my plate. Listen, you didn't come here to hear all that. You came here to hear about from the Lord. Listen. Just like I got the recipe from the big old mountain man cooking on, what do you call them stoves, them little pots where they put uh, hot coals on the top of them and Dutch ovens, is that what you call them? He, he, he put hot coals on all around that thing and it, it cooked it out in the yard off of the hot coals that he made. And I learned some things from that old boy, just like I learned from him and I made something for her. So Jesus... Learned from the Father, and he came with the same recipe to make it for me. You ain't getting Baptist rhetoric. He that eateth, what? Talk to me. My flesh, and drinketh, he's giving you himself. Even as the Father gave himself to the Son. The words that I speak to you, they're not mine. They're the Father's. And dear soul, it all depends on how hungry we are. Because in Christ's mind, and I wouldn't tell him any different. In Christ's mind, spiritual hunger is a blessed thing because God has got a big old, what do you call them big old spoons, Chris? Uh, uh, a ladle, is that, reach down in it and get all, get all you want. Not just an eyedropper. You in the eyedropper category, class, fine. Stick your head up. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it with good things. That's what the scriptures say. But, honey, if you've got an appetite for Jesus, he's got more than what you'll need. Ain't that good? Doorbell rang. Hungry Jack came in. Starving to death. Almost a third of that was still left in the pan. And thanks to... A couple of feathers. I successfully cooked a 10 pound ham in an instant pot the day before. And I stabbed that sucker so many times you wouldn't believe it. And I poured honey all over it. And I poured pineapple juice and chunks of pineapple all in it. And man, locked that sucker down. And I didn't know when it was ready. That's how the birds of the feather had to flock together with me and tell me, go ahead and take the lid off because the little button hadn't popped down all the way yet. And he came to come in, and he got the rest of that mountain man's dinner, breakfast, and then sliced off poor old porky pig. He ain't never going to walk again. He ate so much ham, that that leg ain't never going to be able to be put back on that hog again. And it filled him up too. So I had one week, thankful, had hunger, Appreciate what I did. 
Got the same thing the rest of us did. Got a bite. I'm full. The other one came in biting the doorknobs off the doors, hungry so bad. He ate everything there was except the fork and the plate. And he said, man, that was good. I'm glad I stopped by. I said, I'm glad you did too because we'd had a lot of stuff left over. Everybody got the same food. Everybody benefited from what the cook received from somebody else who was a more experienced cook. We're all here today getting the same food. His flesh, his blood. And all of us are getting it from the one who got it from the big and the main cook, the father. It's the father's pleasure to give it to you little flock and I didn't change the recipe even as the father gave me I give you what did he give you all authority in heaven and in earth took it away from Nebuchadnezzar took it away from Darius took it away from Alexander the Great took it away from Julius Caesar and all of those kingdoms fell. Yes. And then the last kingdom, the fifth and final and eternal kingdom, is being ruled by the sovereign Lord, Redeemer, Savior, Christ. And what we don't do that I'm ashamed of myself for not doing, and I pray for you that you'd start doing it, is realize that we should not have more fear for Julius Caesar. We should not have more uh, fear for Nebuchadnezzar who had lives in their hands than we do for Jesus Christ because he has souls in his hands and they die eternally. All authority. Nebuchadnezzar's, Alexander's, Darius the Mede, Julius Caesar. Nobody has authority like me. I've got it all. And it was the Father's good pleasure to give it to me. Because I thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But I began to come down. And I came so far down that I touched the cross. Next word. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and had given him a name which is Why are we afraid of men when that fear belongs only to Christ? The sovereign, absolute ruler of everything in existence. The devils in hell fear and tremble from him. What about us? We ought to understand that there is no fear that can overcome us as we have the fear of the Lord Jesus Christ in our soul. Not cringing, but reverential respect like we respect our parents. Fearful not to do what they say because it would be an affront to sonship if we did not obey them. And so, dear soul, here's your mountain man's breakfast. There was three of us and all th each one of the three ate different portions. And one of them slapped half of a hog's leg on his plate and ate every bit of it. Did I hear any of y'all back yonder about 15 minutes ago say I'm full? Did God hear you say 
He always stays in the pulpit so long, gets so tired. I'm full. Guess what? That's it. I went and got her plate out of her lap. Asked her if she needed anything else. She said, no. I didn't dare reach for the plate in the other fellow's <laughs> grasp because I respect my hand too much. But you almost didn't have to wash his plate. It was so clean when he got through. I wondered if he, never mind. What's your point? Did I hear any of y'all about 15 minutes ago say, I'm full? Have you been under this feeding here in this local assembly or whatever, wherever you were, long enough to be able to have your appetite enlarged and God has put down the eyedropper and it's taken up that big old spoon and put it on your plate and have you ever come to the place after the feeding say I wish I had some more of that it's entirely up to you don't look at the one next to you, the one behind you, or the one in front of you. Look at, you. look at yourself. Examine yourselves. What kind of appetite have we developed for the glory of God? If we are still in religion, we've had enough. But I think I remember Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. Where did it come from? It was sent down from heaven. It smells so good while it's cooking. It just fills the whole house with its aroma. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And they come over to you and they say, would you like bread? And I say, has a cat got a climbing gear? You don't need to ask me that in Outback. Bring me the bread, man. And while it's still hot, that little black loaf, and it's little. And that little honey butter, I start cutting it and passing it out. Man, it tastes so good. But I've never got so full of bread that I didn't want to eat the meal that I ordered. I've never had so much of Jesus that I didn't want more. I have never had a message, no matter how edifying it was, from the Lord. It wasn't that knucklehead standing up there. It was the Lord speaking to me. It was so good I didn't want to leave. But I had to. Time goes on. We have to go on. And you know what? The next day when I was trying to remember it for myself, I couldn't remember all that was said. And then when I tried to tell it to somebody else, it was gone. And therefore, I wanted to eat again. So I'll tell you what I did. I got my own recipe out and I got into it and I sought not for the words on the page but for the word of glory and I bowed my head and I said oh Lord I'm hungry again take the veil away take the scales from my eyes Open mine eyes that I might see. Lord, open the scriptures and open my heart as he did both in Luke chapter 24 with the disciples. Open the scriptures. Open my heart that I might see the only thing worthy of being revealed. These are they which testify of me. O oh Lord, 
May I lay my head upon your breast and fill my soul with the satisfaction of your love and your glory. You know what he had never said? Never said no. Now you could eat out of that skillet until it's empty. And that ham don't weigh 10 pounds anymore. (laughs) But you can't eat so much of God that you can even diminish his content one itsy bitsy teensy tightsy little iota. Do you know what the Hebrew word for the soul is? He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living. You know what that word soul is? Appetite. Well, Ms. Jones, I see you had a baby. Yes, beginning to look more and more like a baby, not a red lizard. It looked like a red wrinkled lizard when it first was born, but it's beginning, yeah, looks like, well, how is it eating? Is it healthy? Wait a minute. Why is that the only question you ask? Does it have an appetite? It said you wouldn't believe it. It goes after it like a hog after a slop, but then he's all right. She's okay. Well, Lord, I see that you've had some babies. Yeah. Well, are they healthy? Are they spiritual? He said, if they taste and see that the Lord is good and they come to have that blessed hunger, they shall be filled. And I will take care of them, worlds without end, so that there are absolutely trillions of souls in his presence right now in eternity without any bodies. How in the world are they being sustained? They're drawing off him as he draws off the Father. You know what I think the gnashing of teeth is in eternity, and it took me a long time uh, in hell. You know what I think the gnashing of teeth is in outer darkness? It took me a long time to figure this out. They're trying to eat something and they ain't got nothing to eat. Friend, your skillet ain't never going to be empty. You cannot diminish Christ. Then why don't you go at it like hungry Jack did when he came in the door and he had to get out of the way between him and the skillet full of mountain man's breakfast. It's up to you. I pray And please forgive me for saying this. It's just a worldly term, but I don't mean it negatively. I pray that God would make you fat and sassy. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I am the bread of life. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life. Even as I am sustained by feasting off the Father, even so you can feast off of me.